okay next rings and in rings this is the next one we have to determine all integers n greater than 1 for which n minus 1 factorial is a 0 divisor in zn or zn the ring zn so let's see what those n are okay so we start off like this if n greater than 1 is a prime number then we know that this ring is a physics and hence cannot have zero divisors because fields don't have zero divisors fields are integral domain the consequence of this fact is that if for some n in zn n minus 1 factorial becomes a zero divisor then n cannot be a prime number n has to be composite this implies that if for some now we cannot write composite just yet if for some integer n greater than 1 n minus 1 factorial is a zero divisor in z n then n has to be that means the prime numbers are ruled out okay we need not look at prime numbers now our search narrows down to the set of composite integers okay let n be greater than okay so what i'm trying to do here is this let n be greater than 4 be a composite integer or instead okay let me change the language because this is a supposition which uh, we are going to prove is wrong suppose there exists a composite integer n greater than 4 for which n minus 1 factorial is a zero divisor in the end okay so this is our supposition now and being composite n will have a non-trivial factorization so we consider one such factorization let
एन बी इक्वल टू ए बी वायर दीज आर इंटेजर्स satisfying these inequalities these inequalities make sure that this factorization of n is non trivial that is these factors a and b are non trivial factors proper factors divisors both of them are different from both one as well as n okay but they among themselves they may be equal or may not be equal okay the, both those cases are there and we have to handle them both of them if a is different from b then both a and b appear in this expression for n minus 1 factorial okay so here we are looking at the case where a and b are distinct and we are saying that they both appear here somewhere in this among these factors why you see you look at these inequalities say you look at a a is greater than 1 but a at the same time is less than n so definitely a will be here one a will be equal to one of the these factors so a appears here somewhere but just like that b also appears because b is not equal to a so you cannot say that since already a has appeared it may be the case that b does not appear but that will happen only if b is equal to a which it is not in this case so b also appears here and in fact if a is less than b then starting from this side b will appear after a but if a is greater than b then first b will appear and then a will appear but both of them in in any case appear but then their product is already available in in this larger product and their product is n so that means n is dividing n minus 1 factorial so n divides the integer n minus 1 factorial but when that happens then in this ring n minus 1 factorial is equal to 0 the zero element which implies this is equal to 0 in zn and this is a contradiction what is being contradicted namely the hypothesis that this is a zero divisor in zn a zero divisor by definition in any ring not just in zn by definition a zero divisor is first of all a non zero element okay so zero is not a zero divisor so that is being contradicted a contradiction so it cannot be that a and b are distinct so that means they have to be equal so 
we must have a equal to b i e n is equal to a square now the integers a squared minus a and a squared minus 2a both appear in again in minus 1 factorial and this time we are going to write one more line this is equal to because n is a squared a squared minus 1 times a squared minus 2 and so on at some stage we will have a squared minus a and again at some stage we will have a squared minus 2a then 2 times 1 3 2 1 but the question is how are we sure about this note that for this to happen a square minus a should lie between 1 and a square minus 1 that is this should be true Let, let's just see what we have done is logically sound or not this should be true okay now what about the first inequality the first inequality is true if and only if minus 1 is greater than or equal to minus a if and only if 1 is less than or equal to a and this last one is true in fact a is actually strictly greater than 1 so there is no problem with the first inequality i mean this one what about this one a square minus a of course is a times a minus 1 now note that a is a positive integer greater than 1 so a minus 1 is also a positive integer in fact if even if you take the smallest possible value of a say 2 i'm just simply saying okay if you take a equal to 2 without thinking about any other i mean whatever other restrictions we may have on a without thinking about them just you take a equal to 2 even then a minus 1 is 1 and 1 times 2 this is greater of course it's greater than or equal to 1 in fact it will be strictly greater than 1 so this second inequality is also true so a square minus a actually appears among these factors is this also the case for a square minus 2a let's see for a square minus 2a again we need these inequalities okay so let's look at the first one the first one is equivalent to this which in turn is equivalent to this this is all the more uh, true i mean already a is greater than one so 2a will be in fact even greater than that so there is no problem with this one that means the first inequality is true and in fact you can see that it will appear towards that side i mean it will uh, b to the right of a square minus a it's even smaller than a square minus a so of course because already a square minus a is less than or equal to this so this will lie on that side there is no problem from this side but what about this side a square minus 2a is a times 
a minus 2 is this greater than or equal to 1 most of the values of a will not create any problem except a equal to 2 can a be 2 a actually cannot be 2 that's because when a is 2 n is 4 and according to our supposition we have considered n to be greater than 4 okay so that is why both of these things will appear in this factor but there is still one more issue namely that can these two be equal they can never be equal because if they are equal then minus a has to be equal to minus 2a and because a is non-zero cancelling a from both sides would then give you minus 1 equal to minus 2 which is false so both of them actually do appear in this product okay and to justify i mean to write these justifications we are of course not going to write everything we will just simply mention note that a is greater than 2 since n is greater than 4 that's why this is justified now note that from this one a will come out and from this one also one a will come out so these two factors are each one of them is giving us one a so together they give us a square which is n so again we are getting that problem here also thus n equal to a square divides n minus 1 factorial and we have the same contradiction as above I mean this one So, our last supposition is wrong, i.e. for no composite integer n greater than 4 is this a 0 divisor in zn and this leaves us with exactly one case namely n equal to 4 because you see when when the modulus is prime we have seen that it's not possible because the ring becomes a field but when the modulus is composite and greater than 4 in that case also we have just now seen that it's not possible in the ring this 4 minus 1 factorial is what 4 minus 1 factorial is 3 factorial which is 6 but because of this ring it is 2 and 2 is a 0 divisor because 2 is non zero and 2 times 2 is equal to 0 so 2 is a 0 divisor this is a
0 degrees that's so our required n is only n equal to 4 so only that single value is uh, the value that we are seeking so here the solution ends Then the next one, thirty-nine. Suppose that A and B belong to an integral domain. some integral domain is there in which a and b are elements now there are two parts part a if the fifth power of a equals the fifth power of b and the third power of a equals the third power of b prove that a is equal to b and then there is a part b which is uh, the general version of this if a to the power m is equal to b to the power m and the nth power of a equals the nth power of b where m and n are positive integers which are relatively prime that are relatively prime prove that a is equal to b now you can clearly see that if we solve part b then part a is a consequence of that so we are just going to do that The solution is already there, but uh, it's not given fully in the answer. So a hint is there, but that hint is enough. So the solution is this. In fact, we should uh, write like this since part A is a consequence of part B, B only solve part B, okay. And we proceed like this. If one of these two is zero, then so is the other. Why? Say A is zero. 
then you look at this equation then that equation becomes 0 equal to b to the power m now if b is non zero then because we are in an integral domain and m is a positive integer b to the power m will also be non zero contradicting the equation so b also then has to be equal to zero just like that if b is zero then a is also zero you can draw the same conclusion if you use this equation same thing so that's why we say that if one of them is zero then so is the other but then both of them are zero and hence equal so in that this particular case we need not do anything else so assume both of them are non-zero now it's given that m and n are positive integers that are relatively prime so from basic properties of greatest common divisors we know this since these are relatively prime we have this 1 equal to alpha m plus beta n for some integers alpha and beta Okay, now let us look at the possible signs of alpha and beta. Okay, but just now I have noticed something else. Um, is it possible for uh, say one of them to be equal to zero? that is alpha and beta I am talking about them say m is equal to 1 right then whatever n is we can take beta equal to 0 and alpha equal to 1 okay because then m will be equal to 1 and this will be the equation okay okay so what will happen in that case let me just quickly see if m is equal to 1 oh then okay in that case we need not do anything because this equation would just simply become a equal to b similarly if n is 1 then using the other equation we would just simply automatically get a equal to b so we first handle this if m is equal to 1 or n is equal to 1 or both of them are 1 then we are of course done so let m and n be different that means both of them are different from 1 and as a result neither alpha nor beta can be 0 this implies both alpha and beta are non zero now the question of their signs comes are they positive are they negative not one thing that both m and n are positive 
so neither can alpha and beta both be positive nor can they both be negative because you see if alpha and beta are both positive and things m and n are not equal to 1 so they are greater than 1 so automatically in that case this alpha m plus beta n will be greater than 1 it cannot be equal to 1 and if alpha and beta are negative then the right hand side is a negative integer so how can it be equal to 1 so one of them must be positive and the other must be negative since m and n are both greater than 1 that automatically also includes positivity one of these two is positive and the other is negative so we assume without loss of generality that alpha is positive and beta is negative say so. i need ink without loss of generality let alpha be positive and beta be negative okay oh i forgot what did we have m alpha plus n beta okay then now we will start our calculation and the calculation is this a to the power let me just uh, arrange it first of all so we have alpha 1 equal to alpha m plus beta n we are assuming that beta is negative okay so that means alpha m is equal to 1 plus minus beta times n okay so we start with this equation now you can raise both sides to the alpha power that we can just simply do but the fact is that that thing actually is also equal to a to the power alpha m keep in mind that although this looks like a rule of exponents but it's not the rule of exponents that we have in group theory why because we are here what is the binary operation here that you see it's the multiplication in your integral domain that means in your ring but with respect to the multiplication operation a ring is not necessarily a group and uh, well it is actually not a group due to the presence of the zero element with respect to multiplication the ring is never a, any ring is never a group so then what is this it turns out that this law is also true in rings provided we Keep in mind, we make sure that the exponents involved are all 
positive integers which they are m is positive alpha is also positive and one can prove this law by induction just like how we prove the corresponding rule for i mean rule for exponent in group theory just like that here also we can prove it and because of the positivity of the exponents involved it's just one induction okay so that's what we have used here and now in place of alpha m we just write this 1 plus minus beta n 1 plus minus beta n Now, in place of these things, we write a times a to the power n to the power minus beta. On this side, we write b times b to the power n whole to the power minus beta. Here also, we have used um, rule of exponent. In fact, both of them. This one which we are using here as well as the other one that involves uh, summation of exponents. Can we do that in a ring? Yes, we can provided we make sure that everything involved in the exponent is a positive integer. Now they are. One is a positive integer, n is given to be positive and because beta is negative minus beta is a positive integer. And this rule of exponent can also be proved just like the one we have in group theory. Okay. Now since we also have this we have this equal to this and this is not equal to 0. Why? Because we have already uh, assumed that both a and b are non-zero and because we are in an integral domain so these powers of b and powers of a where the exponents involved are all positive must also be non-zero. But now look at this. You are in an integral domain in which you have an equation like this where on both sides you have the same thing, same factor and that is non-zero. So you have the cancellation law in your integral domain. You can use that to have a equal to b. Thus, a is equal to b or if you want to be more explicit you can write cancelling this from both sides of the above equation we get a equal to b. So this completes the solution and uh, let me end the video here itself. Next week we are going to solve more exercises and in fact because uh, this Saturday we have done both group and ring exercises from Galleon so next Saturday we are going to again solve problems from Lee and tomorrow of course we have our usual analysis where we are now going through countability I think the um, section is already over we have to start solving the exercises so see you tomorrow with real analysis. Until then, this is me, Lucifer from a mathematical room. Have a nice night.